my greetings from Glasgow, Scotland to everyone around the world. This series of Marlene and Friends, I'm going to be sharing with you the most amazing group of people who have incredible skills and expertise to make our world one of health and peace for everyone who lives here, humans and non-humans alike. Hi, my guest today, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr., an internationally known surgeon, researcher and clinician at the Cleveland Clinic. He's going to share with us how heart disease can be prevented, reversed and even abolished. 23 years ago, while chairman of the Cleveland Clinic's Breast Cancer Task Force, he grew disappointed in the way that he and his colleagues were treating cancer and heart disease. This was particularly frustrating given the fact that the research studies had already suggested an obvious culprit. The fatty American diet was, in all likelihood, responsible for heart disease and many Western cancers. Targeting heart disease, Dr. Esselstyn's experiments started at home. He and his wife Anne adopted a plant-based diet, cutting out oil, meat, chicken, fish and dairy. They really are truly unique and known for their personal approach, supporting and sharing food and recipes with their patients. As Dr. Esselstyn says, it means a lot to the patients to know that their doctor is making the same changes that they are. And studies show a craving for fat diminishes the less fat one eats. So since patients have hundreds of recipes from which to choose from, Dr. Esselstyn and his heart patients have done so comfortable with their routine over time. How amazing is that? One of the reasons why I simply just adore the work that they both do. You will find details of Dr. Esselstyn's books, DVDs and other information on the website at www.dresselston.com. Hi, I'm Marlene Watson Tara in Service for a Healthy World. Today I'm delighted to welcome the fantastic Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. of the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Centre in Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Esselstyn. Marlene, what a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. When I first read your book, Reverse and Prevent Heart Disease, it was immediately added to our students' recommended reading list. And here in Scotland, I have friends who are doctors and cardiologists, not general surgeons like yourself, but cardiologists, and I've given all of them your book. It details such a groundbreaking program backed by the irrefutable results from your incredible 20-year study. And you've proven changes in diet and nutrition can actually cure heart disease. Well, I think the exciting thing is to realize that although it's the number one killer uh, in, of women and men in the United States, I have a feeling that uh, coronary artery disease is, is not unheard of in Scotland. No, in fact, it's our number one killer too, and that's why we desperately need you. We need you over here, Dr. Esselstyn. Tell Anne, your wife, I'm going to come and kidnap you. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Can we go back a few decades and, and I'd like to ask you uh, and share, you know, with the world, you know, your disappointment at the time and the way that you and your colleagues were treating cancer and heart disease and the frustrations that you felt that you, you felt you weren't doing enough, that more could be done. Well, how I uh, first sort of transitioned into an interest in nutrition was in the late 1970s and early 80s, while I was chairman of our breast cancer task force, I became increasingly disenchanted with the fact that for no matter how many women that I was doing breast cancer surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And that motivated me to do a bit of global research, and it was quite striking to find that breast cancer, for instance, in places like Kenya, was 30 to 40 times less frequent than in the United States. And if you looked at breast cancer in rural Japan in the 1950s, it was very infrequently identified. And yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And perhaps even more compelling was a cancer of the prostate. If you look at the number of autopsy proven deaths <clears throat> from cancer of the prostate in the entire nation of Japan in 1958, there were 18 cases. Uh -huh. One of the most mind boggling public health figures I've known. By 1978 in Japan, there were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 
who will die in this country this year from cancer of the prostate. But somewhere along the line there, I sort of had the feeling that my bones might long be dust before, before I... <laughs> I think not, Dr. Esselstyn. Before I could get the answers to, uh, uh, to cancer and uh, nutrition, although in hindsight, I'm not sure that's correct. But nevertheless, as part of this global review, it was apparent that there were multiple cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And uh, that motivated me to say that if we really focused our research on cardiovascular disease, if we could get everybody to eat to save their heart, yeah. at the same time they would be saving themselves from the major Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and perhaps pancreatic. And so that's really in 1985 when I initiated that initial study with a small number of patients who were seriously ill with cardiovascular disease. They had failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for this procedure, or they had refused. And five were told by their expert cardiologists that they wouldn't live out the year. Well, those five uh, all made it beyond uh, 20 years. And it was really quite exciting to, uh, to see what happened to these people uh, who were so sick with heart disease, and to see them be empowered as the locus of control to halt and to reverse their disease, which wasn't really being touched at all by the usual drugs, procedures, and operations. It's so beautiful, you know, and you're so pure of heart, you know, apart from being a heart surgeon, you're so pure of heart because I know on a personal level, yourself and Anne, your wife, you know, you were involved with these patients, you know, you, you showed them how to cook, you ate together. It's so, it's so beautiful, you know, and, and uh, just breathtaking. Breathtaking. And also, I know um, Bill Clinton, ex-president uh, of the U.S., was um, obviously on your program, too, for reversing his heart disease. Well, on, uh, yes, on television, uh, President Clinton was kind enough to give some kudos to three of us, uh, uh, to, our, to his reading our book, mm -hmm. to his uh, uh, interaction with Dean Ornish, and also his uh, uh, reading of the Colin Campbell's uh, China study. But the, the, the thing about the research that was uh, at least very frightening to me at first was I, have, I was not a trained psychologist and I was wondering how uh, I could get these patients to adhere because this is sure. a rather profound nutritional alteration that I was asking of these people. And I therefore reached out to use the same mantra for these patients that I was using for my cancer patients that I had learned years ago from a marvelous West Coast surgeon named of, uh, Bert Dunphy. And Bert had said that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer, mm. patients with cancer are not afraid to die, but patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their family or their physicians. So for the first five years of the study, I saw every patient every two weeks in my office. We drew their cholesterol, we looked at uh, their weight, their blood pressure, and I went over every morsel they ate. At the end of five years, I was getting a little more courageous, and I stretched it out to once a month. Mm -hmm. By the end of a decade, and now they were pretty well on autopilot, so we began doing it uh, quarterly. Uh, that was uh, the initial study, and that's what really, I think, uh, it made it so important to have these patients understand uh, the uh, somehow the significance of food was a much more powerful ingredient that will allow them to uh, to be empowered, as I mentioned, to halt and reverse this uh, disease. Absolutely. I mean, you know, for me, because of what I've taught for decades, eating right can quite literally save your life. You know, a healthy diet is the most powerful weapon that we all have against disease. And, well, and sir, um, Let's spend one moment and just take a moment and just explain that right now, today, mm -hmm. as we sit here, there are millions of people on the planet yeah. who will never have heard of a statin drug, Absolutely. who will never even have heard of cholesterol. Yeah. They will never have heart disease. Who are they? The Okinawans, the yeah. Papua Highlanders in New Guinea. How about uh, the rural Chinese, yeah. Central Africa, the Tarahumara in northern Mexico? Yeah. What's the common denominator? They are all thriving on whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. Absolutely. 
And uh, that's, a, that's a very, very powerful, uh, powerful mess message. And that brings me to my next question. When and why did you revolutionize the no oil in plant-based diets? <laughs> <laughs> well, this really gets us to the, the hub of the, uh, uh, the whole, how does heart disease start? Mm -hmm. And this is such a vital question to be answered. I think all experts in this disease would agree that where this disease has its inception, its beginning, its onset, sure. is when we progressively injure and destroy the guardian and the life jacket of our blood vessel, which happens to be the delicate innermost lining of the artery called the endothelium. That's the name, the endothelium. The endothelium manufactures an absolutely magic molecule of gas, nitric oxide, which has some absolutely marvelous properties that allow it to protect our vascular system. For example, nitric oxide keeps all the cellular elements in our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Uh, it prevents things from ever getting sticky. Number two, when you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, they widen, they dilate. The arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the strongest vessel dilator in the body. Number three, nitric oxide will decreases the inflammation and stiffness uh, of the uh, wall of the artery, prevents it becoming hypertensive, protects you from getting high blood pressure. Number four, and now this is absolutely key, a safe and adequate amount of nitric oxide will prevent you from ever developing blockages or plaque. So literally, wow. everybody on the, on the planet who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, and compromised the capacity of their endothelial cell to make nitric oxide that they no longer have enough left to protect themselves. However, uh, what are those foods? that injure every time you have these foods such as oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures the endothelial cells, as does anything with a mother or a face, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and anything that's dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, and any excesses of sugar and sweet, maple syrup, molasses, and honey. And I don't like my patients to have uh, coffee with caffeine. Why, why are all these restrictions? Because when you do a brachial artery tourniquet test to measure the capacity of your artery to produce nitric oxide, ingestion of those foods proves a negative test. That is to say, when you eat those foods, and you test, you compromise the capacity of the endothelial cell to make nitric oxide. And uh, that makes it pretty, uh, pretty exciting when, when you s get people to stop ingesting those foods. This is not a malignancy. The endothelial cell mm -hmm. is not being hit by cancer. Yeah. When you stop the injury, it recovers. As it recovers, it makes more nitric oxide. As it makes more nitric oxide, the disease is halted and often we get striking examples of disease reversal. Actually, there are eight ways that you can measure uh, disease reversal. Wow. One, obviously, the one that's pretty jazzy mm -hmm. is when you look at the angiogram of the catheterization study and show that where the artery blockages and then it begins to diminish. Okay. Now, that may happen, not in everybody, but it may happen in one-fourth of people, but nevertheless, even those persons who have, are in their 50s and 60s with an older piece of blockage or plaque, it is made up of fibrosis and scar and calcification, and it's never going to go away. Those patients also are in no way compromised from enjoying the same benefits and can get, can get back to full activities of daily living without restriction. And the, uh, the thing that's so exciting about... Uh, is that these patients will see themselves improving promptly. Yeah. 
And as they do, they just, you've got them hooked. Because none of the things that we're doing today in standard cardiology medicine are treating the causation of the illness. Sure. And there's been really a, a basic covenant of trust between the caregiver and the patient since the days of Hippocrates, mm -hmm. that wherever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. Sadly today, in cardiovascular medicine, that's not being done. I think that's probably fair to say across the board in medicine, would you not say? Um, you know, for me here, I know when I'm working with clients and they have heart disease or cancer or whatever, uh, they go see their doctors, Dr. Esselstyn, and not one of them ever say, you know, anything about diet. They laugh, in fact, and say it's nothing to do with diet, you know. So we're way behind. We need, we need you over here. That's why I'm going to come and kidnap you. What is the latest nutritional research actually saying on reversing cardiovascular disease? How are you getting the medical profession to listen to you and, and come on board? Well, I think the way that this has to be done is with... You can't do it with hype or with snake oil. No. You've got to do it with science. And that's why increasingly uh, those of us who are committed to this, I think before we ever make these statements, before I ever wrote the book for the public, sure. we did the research. Now that we were rightfully criticized because that was a small group of patients. Okay. Uh, actually 18 who had to follow up angiograms, but it was mm -hmm. striking enough that, that we really had, I think, answered what uh, people call the scientific method, namely, the scientific method, you describe your theory, you know, we can reverse heart disease with food, sure. and then you do the experiment. It either succeeds or it doesn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the theory. We changed the food, will it happen? Yes, there are eight ways that we have proved this, I think, without doubt. One, we've mentioned the reversal of the disease uh, in the artery itself. Two, uh, the reversal of the stress test. If their stress test is abnormal when they go in with their chest pain. Yeah. And if they decide not to have the standard of the angiogram, what have you, or the procedure, go to the nutritional modification. And what they find is within 10 or 12 months when they repeat the stress test, it's now either markedly improved or back to normal. Number three, there's a thing called a PET scan. A PET scan will show us areas of the heart. When you label a radioactive isotope, you can see on the PET scan where the blood is going adequately, and then you can also see the area where it is being very poorly perfused with blood. They go to the whole food plant-based nutrition. You repeat this literally. We've seen it happen in days. Within wow. three, three weeks, we could reperfuse that area. Now, we know that we haven't reversed the plaque in that period of time. But you have done so many other things with increasing vessel dilatation, sure. improving blood flow, and relaxation of the vessel that there is now restored flow and reversal on the PET scan that I mentioned. Now the other, of course, is what about the blood vessels going to your head, yeah. the coronary arteries? You can measure the degree of blockage with an ultrasound. And we have shown time and again that when these patients Again, go up with the whole food, plant-based nutrition, repeat the ultrasound a year later, you can see shrinkage and reversal of that blockage. Okay. Now, the other thing happens, of course, is the leg. Mm -hmm. When you see disease in the legs, the same thing applies. You can measure the pulse volume at the ankle. A year later, when you repeat it, if they've been on this, you will see a marked improvement or they're, or they're completely without symptoms. Then, of course, there are the symptoms that you can see change, and this change happens quite rapidly. The chest pain or the angina, the chest pain, can be reversed literally in days, often, or markedly improved. The other, of course, is the uh, clonication, which is the name for sort of angina of the calf muscle or the leg, and, of course, erectile dysfunction can be reversed. So it's very exciting to think that from the scientific method standpoint, that with food and food alone, you can make these changes. It's quite incredible. I mean, it's actually so simple, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Well, that's the exciting thing it is, because instead of breaking the bank with some new procedure or new expensive drug or medication, you're not adding any expense, because you just got to eat. And what you're eating is you're eating, you've stopped eating a pile of delicious food that is destroying you. And you're now eating a pile of delicious food 
that is restoring your health. Absolutely. And that's a perfect that's a perfect that, introduction for me to ask you to share your amazing famous green rhyme. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> well, let me get, uh, give a little background. One of the things that wrinkle that we've added to accelerate this whole process in the last five years is that if you could get your head uh, inside the artery, you would see that that blockage is an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants. Well, mm -hmm. you're not going to get this from pills at a health food store. You're going to get the antioxidants from food. What food? Yeah. Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C. Oxygen radical absorptive capacity. Now, that means if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries, they're wonderful. However, nothing can trump the antioxidant power of green leafy vegetables. So we ask these patients six times a day, I want them to chew a green leafy vegetable roughly the size of their fist after it has been boiled in water five and a half to six minutes or steam. So it's nice and tender. Then you must anoint it with multiple drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. Why? Because the acetic acid in the vinegar has been shown to markedly restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme which is within the endothelial cell and responsible for manufacturing that delightful molecule nitric oxide that we so desire. Uh, so somebody's going to chew this alongside their breakfast cereal. I want it again as a mid-morning snack. I want it again with your lunch and sandwich. Again mid-afternoon. Again at dinner time. God, I adore it when you have that evening snack. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? All day long, you were absolutely bathing and you were basking that horrible oxidative cauldron of inflammation with nature's most powerful antioxidants. And uh, what are the green leafy vegetables I'm talking about? They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, snappy cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, Parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus, and that's just a few. Amazing, fantastic, bravo! I mean, you know, when you when you explain it so simply and so beautifully like that, you wonder why the world's not doing it. You know, it's just incredible. It's unbelievable. So, you know, you know, beacon of hope to to everybody around the planet that wants to start learning, and it should be something that's taught in schools as well. Hmm? Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> Are you currently teaching right now? Are you? Um, yes, I. Every uh, every month uh, at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute, mm -hmm. I conduct a an intensive uh, seminar, five and a half hours, Great. to a group. We try to limit the group to no more than ten or uh, ten or twelve patients who will always come with their spouse or a significant other. You must. Look, if you're going to ask for this type of profound change, yeah. I mean, next to religion and sex, there's nothing as personal. <laughs> it's food. It's food. And uh, when this group is together uh, with their spouse for five and a half hours, they're going to learn all about, in phraseology and vocabulary, that they can grasp and get their arms around they're going to learn all about what they have done to create the disease. And at the same time, they're going to learn how they can be empowered as the locus of control to halt and reverse this disease. And yet everybody gets a very hefty, hefty notebook at that time that has a copy of every PowerPoint that I use throughout the seminar, plus several of our scientific articles, wow. plus a 44-page handout with many additional recipes that add to the 240 in the two books that we will provide them. Then there's this marvelous uh, hour and a quarter presentation from a woman who has had 30 years experience acquiring and preparing plant-based foods, dealing with reading ingredients, dealing with travel and restaurants, and then everybody receives a DVD from the entire uh, seminar that I filmed from an earlier one. So if they go home and they get forgetful about some aspect, sure. they can flip this on and get themselves back up to speed. Then we always have three local or regional 
uh, participants who've had a previous successful experience mm -hmm. share their story with those who are in attendance so that those who are there can say to themselves, listen, if he or she can do this, I can do this. And we answer questions, have a delightful plant-based lunch, and then stay in touch as necessary, either through email or phone call. That's and that's, fantastic. that's the most recent group, uh, after following this group close to four years of 200, uh, we felt we were obligated because of uh, the, the criticism that we had with our earlier smaller study was, Dr. Esselstyn, fine, you've got a small group that could do it. How do you know you can do this with a larger group? How do you know you're going to get the same results? So we did it with 200. And now we're close to upwards of, we're, next year we'll be over 800 people. And it's, uh, it's just very gratifying and very exciting to realize that the patients themselves are the ones that can absolutely master this disease. And, and I'm sure you know that what, also, what is also happening when this occurs, when patients go to whole food plant-based nutrition, there are side effects. What are the side effects? <laughs> well, they lose their obesity. Yeah. They lose their hypertension. <clears throat> they lose uh, their diabetes. Yeah. And there's so much else that we in medicine have to recognize that we have not discovered we have stumbled upon the strongest tool that we have ever had in our toolbox because literally 75 to 80 percent of chronic illness need never ever occur i know it's yeah you're doing whole food plant-based nutrition yeah i was sharing with um with colin campbell yesterday you know about um i had written to him a while back I had already lost a sister to cancer, she died, and then my brother contracted prostate cancer and his PSA was so high, it was like 580, and I cooked for him for seven weeks and it came down to 1.6, you know, he did everything I told him, so, you know, they trust and believe in my work, of course, and what I do, oh, it's alright. Are you okay? Um, so, you know, for me, the human body is a miracle in its design and, and I will never stop sharing the passion that I have for, we all deserve to have good health, it's our birthright, so we need to take, as you say, responsibility. You give all your patients the tools and they go do it. But um, I think because of the personal contact that you have with each of them as well is, is really remarkable. It's such a, such a gift that you give to these people. So, you know, congratulations on that. I think you do an amazing job. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that all the, the people that we all collectively, you know, share and push out together because the world still doesn't know at large about the work that you're doing. Really, it doesn't. Marlene, I, I say thank you. You know, the interesting thing is that not only have we found that this treatment will cross state boundaries yeah. and country boundaries, we're treating patients in Canada and Australia and wow. New Zealand and Singapore, and we I, I should share with you, I've had a number of calls from the, uh, from the, UK, from the UK, uh -huh. both uh, some from Ireland and uh, some from Scotland and some from England. And... Uh, it works. It works in the UK. <laughs> it's incredible because here I am, you know, in uh, in Glasgow, and and really the the clients and students that Bill and I have come from around the world. They actually don't come and we're living here. They come from Saudi Arabia, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and we have we could count in the one hand the people we see in Scotland. It's just incredible. So. I don't know whether a big impact we have here is that everything's free, the NHS is free, prescription drugs are free, you pay for nothing, you pay for no surgery, no consultancy work. So I don't know whether that hampers people from paying to come and, and, and learn about health, you know? Well, I think there's one thing that I, I want to be sure to include today while I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, and that is that many physicians uh, well, most physicians have no training in nutrition, yeah. and they have uh, little training in uh, behavior modification, and perhaps they feel a little bit uncomfortable in this regard. But the present format that we're using, uh, where we have a group of people, and we do this for five and a half hours, 
Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a usual physician practice where you're seeing a patient every 10 or 12 minutes, sure, and you give a patient three minutes of nutrition, and if it, we know that's never going to happen, it won't work. So what we suggest for those physicians who do this, who are frustrated with the fact they can't get their patients to change, mm -hmm. think about this as an option. Yeah. Uh, either you might be able to do this in a uh, somewhat of a uh, modified method where instead of the full five hours, maybe you could do it four hours every other Wednesday uh, from five o'clock until nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. Or better yet, some we found some physicians who have, who have trained with us have decided to do this on Saturday morning because there's a much greater likelihood yeah. that, the, that the spouse or significant other will come. And then uh, we anybody who wants to apprentice with us. We've had now close to 150 physicians who have, during the last five years, have come through our program because they wanted to be familiar with it. We're very free to all any of any and all of our materials. We are happy to share with anybody who wants to try to repli replicate this system, as a number of of, uh, of physicians have, with the same results because. If you show a patient respect, and the only way I know to really show a patient respect is to give them our time. Yeah. And suddenly if the patient says, wait a minute, why is this physician wanting to spend five and a half hours with me? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is pretty darn important. Yeah. And then if you also, uh, and this is my own peculiar uh, emphasis, I tend to want to spend a fair amount of time, almost sometimes close to an hour, on the endothelial cell. Why? Because anybody with a brain in their head, mm -hmm. if they can be made to understand the reason that they have had their heart attack, is because they have lost so much nitric oxide from beating up their endothelial cells. Why not stop and let them come back? And somebody says, well, Dr. Esselstyn, what do I do on a my wife's anniversary, or when it's the first uh, of the year, or when it's uh, Memorial Day, or it's the 4th of July, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would you want to celebrate destroying more endothelial cells on your wife's birthday? That doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any sense at all. That's, that's the time you want to be more strict than ever. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, I mean, I don't know what's happening right now here in uh, Scotland, but I seem to be getting a series of um, men with brain tumours, with brain cancer, and they only come to Bill and I when there's no other hope, you know, when the surgery's failed or whatever's failed. And, um, you know, two of them have had fantastic results, you know, 50% reduction in both the tumours, and like just what you said there, you know, one was going on holiday and they were going to celebrate with champagne and wine and everything, and I was like, no, 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 you know, because to me it's crazy, you know, you're reversing and pulling things back, and but what can you do, you know? Let me also spend a moment, because sometimes yeah. this is a way of, uh, of also throwing the hook. Uh, let's What's the good of having a wonderful heart if your brain isn't going to be there when you get older? Exactly. Now, we know from the work of Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast who reported at the stroke meetings in Miami in 2001, they had looked at over 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. And at age 50, they began to see these tiny little white spots appearing on the MRI in the brain. What are these little white spots? These are little strokes. But you know, at age 50, big brain, tiny stroke, no problem. However, before you know it, you're 65. You've now had 15 more years of the good old American diet. And before all, before, <laughs> and more often than not, you find yourself now saying to your lovely, uh, sweetheart, where did I leave the car keys? But, you know, she's kind of understanding. You get through that, you're fine. But now suddenly, you blink your eyes and it's now you're 75. You've had 10 more years of the good old American diet. And now you find yourself saying to your beloved, sweetheart, where did I leave the car? Well, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you get through that. 
Now you suddenly you find yourself, you're 85. You've had 10 more years of the good old American diet. You look at your beloved and say, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> look, it's, come on. I can't so reverse true. that. Yeah. You don't suddenly wake up on your 85th birthday no. with the men. You work hard in all those preceding decades yeah. to lay the foundation for this rascal. And that's one of the things that's so powerful about whole food plant-based nutrition is there's so many of these absolutely unacceptable, crippling, chronic illnesses that absolutely can be eliminated, yeah. annihilated of course. with the whole food plant-based nutrition. Of course. I mean, even, you know, like um, we were talking yesterday, it should be happy, healthy, dead. We shouldn't have all this uh, al Alzheimer's and dementia. And, you know, I write to the government here all the time. I'm sure they're probably going to get a hitman out to me sometime. Um, you know, they were investing 30 million there in the research on dementia, you know, and I write to them and I say, no, invest the 30 million in educating people on a whole food plant-based diet and they won't get dementia. And they write back the same old copy and paste emails to me or letters that come from Downing Street saying, we have the health of the nation handled. So I'm a thorn on the side of the UK government, the Scottish government, but you know, it's probably never going to come from them. It's going to come from people like you and, and people that are educated and that become educated around the world and taking responsibility for their own health. Well, we, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, this year, presently, our new president. There are two, there, uh, I mean, I'm speaking of the uh, president of the American College of Cardiology. Oh, okay. There are two major cardiac organizations mm -hmm. in the United States, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. And the new president of the American College of Cardiology is a wonderful cardiologist from Chicago, from Rush Presbyterian Hospital there. His name is Kim Williams. And Kim Williams really uh, is in total belief of whole food plant-based nutrition, not only for himself, but also for his patients. And that means that we really have sort of a, a foot in the door. Fantastic. Uh, I, uh, I happen to be a member of the Nutrition Committee of the American College of Cardiology, and uh, it's very, it's painful how slow this happens, but when I compare this where we are now yeah. with where we were 30 years ago, I mean, there, it's really very encouraging and very exciting to, these, to, this, to see this happen. And the, Ameri and the United States Dietary Guidelines just came out, and finally they've agreed that there is... Uh, there is no excuse that Americans really ought to eat as little cholesterol as they can. Well, that's fantastic. Well, it is, as you say, it's a slow progress, but it's going in the right direction, yeah. Um, I mean, you've had an incredible career, and, um, you know, when the when I was looking and, you know, uh, recording your biography, I thought it's just unbelievable the work that you've done in the world. Also, um, you know, before we finish, I like to finish on a, a high, a laugh, a fun comment. So what's the funniest thing do you think that's happened to you during your long career? Something that really gave you a good old belly laugh. <laughs> well, what is the funniest thing that's ever happened in my career? Oh, well, some of those are probably not um, able to be repeated. <laughs> but, but I just suggest that people use their imagination. Okay. I think that what is funny is, uh, in, in hindsight, uh, that for for years, I think I always was a little bit uh, uh, anxious about speaking in or in front of people because I remember when I was about twelve years old, I once tried to uh, play a flute so, flute solo. Uh huh. <laughs> totally forgot everything, and I just stood there before the crowd, petrified, with nothing coming out of my mouth. But uh, what, once we uh, we started this whole thing uh, in medicine and the frequency with which, with, through teaching and many other things, I look back very fondly at those uh, uh, at those moments when I was really uh, rather apprehensive and think of how exciting it is to uh, feel more comfortable. Sure. And you feel more comfortable when you have something that you're talking about that you know is absolutely rock solid. Yeah. Scientific proven and it's something that if people would adapt in their lives that they can uh, 
vanquish the chronic illness. Absolutely, you, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, you know, I could talk to you for the whole day. You're you're so charming. You're you you're so easy to listen to. You're the way you put things across. It's like a five year old could understand. So, um, I wish you the best of success again in another year, two thousand and sixteen that we've just started, and um, you know, huge growth for all your programs and courses that you teach around the world and um, I look forward to cooking you a fabulous whole foods plant based meal sometime. So thank you so much Dr Esselstyn, you're a gem. Thank you for being a gift to the world. Thank you.